this will be the right way to do it, and everything will be good. Great. So, like I was saying today, we are in between the holiday of Passover and the upcoming holiday of Shavuos. From the holiday of Passover, the Chabad custom all the way through till Rosh Hashanah, actually, through the summer, every Shabbos afternoon, after the afternoon service, the Mincha service, we read and we study what's called Pirkei Yavis, the ethics of our fathers. There is a tractate in the Mishnah called Ethics of Our Fathers, which we translate, really, it's chapters of our fathers, Pirkei Yavis. And that discusses not law so much as much as it is ethics and not even what you have to do as much as merely the chasidusa, things that are beyond the letter of the law. How you should behave when it means going beyond the letter of the law. Humble. There are five chapters in the Mishnah and the sixth one we add also from the Brises. So if you open up a sitter, most sitters, you have it after the... Shabbos afternoon services, we have the six chapters of Pirkei Bavos. Every week we go through a cycle, one first week, there's six weeks till Shavuos, and after Shavuos we continue all the way till Rosh Hashanah. But before we even begin, Ethics of Our Fathers begins with a, a uh, really a piece of history. How do we get to Torah till the times of the mission? And the first chapter really discusses every generation, but in the, in the first mission in very concise form. So a little bit connected, we just started a new cycle of learning the Rambam. And, the, and in the introduction of, to the book of Rambam, Rambam does something fascinating, and we do it another, another time, but the Rambam goes through Torah from Moses. That's from Moses at Sinai, all the way through the compilation of the Talmud, generation by generation, and he counts exactly 40 generations. By name, not just there were 40 generations. No, no, no. Moses, Joshua, Eli, Shmuel, David, Shlomo. Every single generation, as who the leader of that generation was, who learned Torah from his teacher, from his teacher, going back to Moses. So from Moses till Rav Ashi, the compiler of the Talmud, 40 generations. And from when the Talmud was already put together, um, we already know we have that already is much, much more uh, history that has been documented in different books. But something fascinating to trace back the word of Torah as we know it today, all the way back to Moses at Sinai. Something that's very, very fascinating and unique. But that's chapter one of Ethics of the Fathers. We're not going to be discussing, discussing that today. What I do want to discuss today is actually a Hasidic discourse, a piece of Hasidic discourse, because it's it's something we could all understand, and, and I hope we can appreciate it. And this comes from, there's a custom before, every week, before we study the chapter for that week, we say a little Mishnah. We quote a little Mishnah. We study a little, a little Mishnah. And this is, it's, two, it's a two-liner. It's very, very short. And the Mishnah goes like this. Kol Yisrael, yesh lahem chelek l'olam haba. Every single Jew has a portion or a share in the world to come. Shinamar, as the verse says, Pulam Sadiqim, your nation are all righteous. La'ilam Yeshu artists, they will inherit the land for eternity. Nature Matoi, the branch of my plantings, my say the work of my hands to take pride in. And then we begin with this, we begin the opening Mishnah. That's how we begin the opening Mishnah. Now, what we're going to do today is discuss and discover something fascinating about the world to come. We're talking about what is the world to come? Hey, what, is the what is the world to come? Every Jew has a share in the world to come. Well, what do I have shares of? What exactly do I own? So this refers to, I said, after you pass away, you go to the world to come. In Hebrew, the word olam haba, the world to come, has two different meanings. Is there a world? Is there a place? Once people use that word olam haba, you have to ask them, what are you referring to? Because after you die, your body dies, your soul goes to what we call paradise, or the Garden of Eden, some call it. 
and some people call it the world to come. In other words, the world that follows this world. That's one definition of the world to come. But there's another definition of the world to come, and that is the world that's going to be in the future, in the messianic time, when then there's going to be the resurrection of the dead. That's the world to come in the future. Referring to the world of the resurrected. So in this Mishnah that we're discussing here, from the Mishnais in Sanhedrin, when it says every Jew has a wushir and the world to come, what are we referring to? So the answer is we're referring to the world of resurrection. The time in the future after the Messiah is going to arrive and is going to be a rebuilt temple and all Jews are going to be gathered in Jerusalem. There'll be a period of time after that where God promises is going to be a resurrection of the dead. The dead will return to the living. The souls will return to bodies. Who, who is going to be resurrected? Says the Mishnah, every Jew has a share in the world to come. How do we know that's what the Mishnah is referring to? So very interestingly, the Talmud says, the Mishnah continues and says, we just made a general rule. Everyone has a share in the world to come, right? But then again, well, every rule has an exception. to the, well, These people don't have a share in the world to come. Who is the people who don't have a share in the world to come? Says the Mishnah. Someone who says there's no such thing as resurrection in the world. Never going to happen. It's not true. It's not, I don't believe in it. I don't believe in a resurrection. The Mishnah says you don't believe in the resurrection. You won't be resurrected. No share for you. Why? So the Talmud explains why. It's called measure for a measure. You denied the resurrection, so you won't be participating in the resurrection. But as long as you don't deny the resurrection, if you're a believer in the resurrection, then as long as you fit the bill of Holy Yisrael, all Jews, you're called a Jew, you get a share in the world to come in the world of the resurrection. What's the chidush? What's the novelty? What's the, what's the depth of this teaching? In the book of Psalms, in, in Psalm number 24, in verses 3 and 4, in that Psalm, King David over there says, Mi yale Hashem, Who is able to go up and ascend to the mountain of God? And that he is referring to, what does it mean to go up to ascend the mountain of God? He's referring to Gan Eden, paradise. Meaning, after a person passes from this world, who gets to go and sit and bask in the glory of God? Call it paradise, call it the world to come, call it the Garden of Eden, the spiritual Garden of Eden. Who gets to go there? Says the psalmist, Neki chapayim, someone who has clean hands, uvar levav, and someone who has a contrite heart, someone who's sincere and honest in their dealings, truthful. In other words, you have to be a real upstanding and observant individual. It's no freebie. You don't automatic, there's no automatic entry. There are criteria and qualifications that you have to have in order to enter into that next stage in life. Says the Mishnah, coming with this information and this background, to go to paradise, not everybody goes. Some people go the other direction. But in the future when Messiah comes and is going to be the resurrection, then all Jews, regardless of your behavior, regardless of your qualifications, will have a share in that world. Understood? Kind of sort. Okay. That's the facts. Now we have to understand why and how this could be. How is this possible? How is it possible? What's the question? What's the question we're going to have now? How is it possible for what? How is it possible that in the Garden of Eden, in paradise, we'll call it, is not as 
awesome in terms of divine revelation as the time of the resurrection and messianic age. It's less. It's great. It's awesome. I mean, it's nothing that, nothing that we're experiencing with our five senses. But you can't compare that to what's going to happen in the messianic age in the future. Even the highest level of paradise, in other words, in paradise itself, there are infinite amount of levels. It's not like yeah, there's one spot. It doesn't work that way. On the contrary, we say people are constantly being elevated to a higher level and a higher level and a higher level. You have souls that have been in paradise for thousands of years. And every day they've been, they've been elevated a few times a day. Why? Why what? Why do they get elevated? Court, uh, it's a very good question. According to different things that the, the soul is uh, capable of experiencing, according to different levels, as I'm sorry, according to different times, as they progress, in other words, it's not a stale place, but you, you progress, you get to go higher. People down here also have the ability to help out and assist by yes. doing mitzvahs in the merit of uh, the departed soul, to help and assist them in their travelings um, in the next world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nevertheless, the paradise is experienced when the soul divorces the body. You can't experience paradise while the soul is married to the body, while the soul is invested in the body. There has to be a departure. The soul departs the body. The messianic age, what are we talking about? Resurrection. What does the resurrection mean? The, the soul is going to be returning back into the body, right? The exact body? To the yeah, yeah, into or your body. Any body. No, to your body. To your body. Your body is going to be resurrected. Your body is going to be resurrected. Why is this so? Why is this so? Because the revelation of the messianic age is going to be even greater than the highest revelation that currently exists in paradise. To be a whole new era. Awesome even to those that only live in the spirit. Even those that live in the highest level and bask in the glory of God have never experienced what's going to happen in the future time when Mashiach is going to come I don't mean future as in it's distant away. It happened right now with Hashem's help. But I say future because it didn't happen yet. And nevertheless, what are we saying? In order to merit a share in paradise, which is of, we'll call it lower caliber as compared to the messianic era, you have to behave. We'll call it behave. You got to listen, follow instructions. You got to be a good boy. Right? Kosher. Kosher. But if you want to have a share in the world to come, meaning in the resurrection, then everyone's game. As long as you're Jewish, you're going to be resurrected. It'll be for everybody. How could that be? How could this be so? And then on the, to understand the, the revelation itself, how could it be that the revelation in the times of Mashiach, is going to be greater than that the revelation that exists in paradise. The only reason why the soul has to leave the body to experience paradise is because the revelation is too great for the body, seeming. So then how does it experience, how is the resurrection going to be experienced, if that's even greater than what currently exists in Gan Eden, in paradise? So you're going to say, well, the body composition is going to be different. Some can make an argument and say, we have very coarse bodies today. We're very, very coarse bodies. We're, we need food and you have to have good food and people want to enjoy life, right? We're very, in Yiddish, there's a word called grub. In English, it's translated as coarse. It means that we're, we're, we're very, very materialistic people. Our bodies are very, very physical and materialistic. 
But we know even within nature itself, even within diff there are different types of materials. Some materials are more refined, some are more heavy, and some are more light. Some are thicker and some are thinner. So within the body composition itself, you have people that are very able, they're very refined people, they work, they don't give in to every indulgence, and you see it on them. When you look at them, you see they have a refined glow. Their body, just their simple, their body, it doesn't look like they've been indulging in every single passion and desire that they have. On the contrary, it looks like they've been refraining plenty. Times that by who knows what. When Shiach comes, our body is going to be like even more refined than Adam's body. How refined was the body of Adam? Pure. How pure was Adam? Well, God made him with his own hands, so to speak. Metaphorically speaking, right? Anthropomorphically, God formed Adam. It, can, it doesn't get more, more refined than that, than a creation by Almighty God directly with no human intervention whatsoever. But when Mashiach comes, our bodies, meaning every single body, will be in, the body itself will be of a new, the resurrected body will be even a more refined. Body than Adam's. Very, very, very high level. Nevertheless, it still seems a little bit difficult to understand that a body, whatever character, whatever type and caliber of refineness it's going to have, should be able to be a container for it. the most lofty of light that this world has ever experienced. Why specifically does it have to be in body? Why can't it be? Beauty for the soul. Reward for the soul. Who needs the body here? Why does the resurrection have to take place in the body? Would there be a time when all souls that ever lived now are able to enjoy the amusement park that was the greatest amusement park that was ever created with the most awesome rides? Obviously, all holy and spiritual that really take the soul for a, an adrenaline uh, uh, a trip and bring it to places it's never gone to before. And that would be awesome. Why specifically does the resurrection have to take place in the Shomis Begufim, soul in a body? So, in order to appreciate this, we have to appreciate what it says in the Torah, just a few words. In the portion of Chukas, in the book of Numbers, chapter 19, verse 14, the Torah says like this. It's actually talking about the law of the red heifer. And the, the Torah says, Zois Odom. This is the Torah, man. Now, that's cutting the sentence in half, to be honest. This is the Torah, man shall, or man does, right? It's cutting, but... These three words, Zaysa Torah Adam, actually can be independently read. This is the Torah, man, meaning that the Torah is really like a reflection of man. It's a mirror image of man. How so? In the most general sense, a human being exists by the marriage of body and soul. There's a composition that has to take place where the body has to have a soul inside of it. That gives human life. That gives all life, for a matter of fact. There's the physical side of it, and then there's the spiritual soul. But within the human race, within the human being, it's the greatest level of godliness, soul, godly spark that exists over there. So too in Torah, there's two parts of Torah. There's the body of Torah, and then there's the soul of Torah. What is the body and what is the soul of Torah? The mitzvahs, the commandments, the observances, these are all what the uh, Kabbalah calls a vorim de malka, limb, limbs of the king, meaning they are like the body. The body has limbs. The mitzvahs are the limbs. 
The commandments are the limbs. That's the composition of the body. So then what is the Torah? Not the mitzvah side of what's the Torah itself? The book of Torah is the soul. That is the soul. So just like in a person, you have a body and a soul. Within Torah itself, you have the body of it and the soul of it. The mitzvahs are the body and the soul is the Torah. This is why we find something very interesting. Today we can't bring sacrifices, animal sacrifices. We no longer bring animal sacrifices. Nevertheless, there is a teaching in the Talmud that says, whoever studies, actively studies the laws of the sacrifices, it's as if they brought a sacrifice. How does that work? How could it be that if you're studying about a law of the sacrifice, do we consider it as if you actually went and brought a sacrifice? First of all, let's say the sacrifice had to be brought in the morning. We're learning at night. I'm bringing a sacrifice at the wrong time. That's terrible, right? Well, how do we make sense of this? But now we have a new appreciation because if Torah is the soul, the soul is a spirit. The soul is not bound by time and space. The soul for itself is not bound by time and space. The only thing which is bound by time and space are the is the body, which that corresponds to the mitzvahs. So if I'm doing a mitzvah, if I'm performing a mitzvah, so then it's time bound. You have to blow a shofar on the day of Rosh Hashanah, put film on every single morning except for Shabbos. Mitzvahs have a time and a specific place where they are to be observed. Torah, the soul, is timeless. It's not bound by anything because that's the soul, that's the spirit. So when I study Torah, no matter what time, no matter what place, it's as if I'm actually offering and bringing the sacrifice. In the spiritual sense, it doesn't have to be tied to any time or space. Now we can take this a step further. Just like in Torah and Mitzvahs, we have the separation. So too, it's the way Torah and Mitzvahs apply to the person who is observing them or doing them. When I study Torah, me personally, you, any one of you, when you study Torah, we are primarily doing a spiritual exercise. And therefore, it's primarily connected with my soul. When I do a mitzvah, when I perform a mitzvah, it's with my body. And therefore, it's primarily connected with my So Torah mitzvahs itself, there's a body of Torah and a soul of Torah. And the person who is performing the mitzvah or studying the Torah also, as I'm doing this intake, it's primarily an in a, a, a spiritual uh, ingestation for my soul. It's giving my soul life. It's nourishment for the soul. When I'm doing a mitzvah, that's connecting with my body, with my mouth, with my head, with my hand, with my leg, with my words, etc., etc. Which one is greater, Torah or mitzvahs? It's a good question. It's a big debate. The big debate, the Talmud, this debate goes back to the Talmud, and the Talmud ends up saying that Torah study is greater because it leads to mitzvahs. So now how do you explain it? Which one is greater? This is greater because this is going to bring me to that. Well, that seems to indicate that that's greater, but this but it doesn't say that's greater. It says this is greater because it brings me to that. At least it's a little bit confusing. Even the conclusion is a little bit confusing, to be honest with you. But be that as it may, Chassidus explains that there are two perspectives. There's the bottom-up perspective and the top-down perspective. Or the way it's called in the language of Chassidus and Kabbalah is, there, the, there is the way something is in its current form, where me and you perceive it and connect to it. 
And then there is the way it's actually in its source. The source is not where we connect to it. That's where it originates from. The way it is down here in this world, the Torah is greater than the mitzvahs. But in its original, in its source, the mitzvahs are greater. Because the mitzvahs are the will of Hashem. The Torah is the wisdom of God. Think for a moment. What's more you? What's more your core? What's deeper within you? Your wisdom or your will? Did you think before you spoke? Your will is far deeper than your wisdom, much more than your knowledge. Your will, that's why if there's, we say if there's a will, there's a way. If you will something, if you want something, <coughs> that passion, that desire, that will, coming from a much deeper place, much more essential, much more rooted in your core than your wisdom, which comes more soul-based, core-based than your wisdom and your intellect. Which is why the Torah serves as a explanation for the mitzvahs. If I want to know how to perform a mitzvah, where do I look? The manual, how to live, you look in the Torah. So the Torah is telling me how I'm supposed to behave. So what's paramount? The study or my behavior? This is there as a manual to teach me how to play the game. But the objective is to play the game and to win the game. Can't play and win if you don't know the rules. Well, that's why you need to have Torah. That's very important. So the Torah serves really as a guide for how to perform, how to live the way a Jew is supposed to live. But then you need the will to pursue it. Correct, 100%. You have to want to. You kind of want to do it, yeah. One million percent, you got to want to. If you don't want it, then you don't will it. It ain't going to happen. You can have all of the knowledge. You can have all the knowledge in the world. But if you don't will it, it's not going to happen. How do you get to the will? That's connected with das. Das is the application. You have to apply it to life. It's not only to have, not only enough to have the knowledge. The knowledge has to be applied. Application is, is most important. Okay. So let's apply this rule now to the body and the soul. See how this works. What's greater, the body or the soul? Something fascinating is going to emerge over here. No, you never thought about it. No, no one ever thought like this before. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you what's greater, my body or my soul, what are you going to tell me? Soul. My soul. It's a spiritual, right? My body is just a piece of flesh and earth here today, gone tomorrow. And that's the truth, the way we see it. Down here in this world, the way we relate to it, the soul is much loftier than the body. But if the Torah is the soul and the mitzvahs are the body, in their source, who, what's greater, Torah or mitzvahs? The mitzvahs, the will is greater than the wisdom, which means, translate that to me now, my body is actually sourced from a loftier place than my soul is. The Jewish body is sourced from a greater place than even the Jewish soul. When you have a relationship with, let's say, a parent-child relationship, so me and my parents. My parents love me, hopefully. Hopefully every parent loves their child. Let's, we're going to go with the assumption that they love you. If they don't love you, it's unfortunate. Something interfered with the love. But there is an essential love that's there. If nothing ruins it, it's going to be there, even in an expressed form. If something ruins it, it can be suppressed. Parent loves my parent loves me. How much they love me, how much the parent love the child, there's no greater love. No greater love that can be expressed than the love between a parent and the child. But even that love takes into account the child. The parent loves the child. They take into account the child is, is, as, as a source of love, as the reason for, as the catalyst for my love to you, because you exist. 
That's why I love you. So that's a very high in terms of love. But where does that love emanate from? That love doesn't start until you exist. Until the child exists, the love isn't there. Now let's say, maybe there's a deeper place. And that is the love, the interest that God has in the Jewish body. By the mere fact that the body has absolutely no reason to love it. No reason to choose it. There is no difference between a Jewish body and a non-Jewish body. All bodies are the same. And God said, we say, God shows us. The word choice, the Torah uses the word choice. The word choice is very specific. You can only have choice, as Siddhis explains, free choice, when you have two equal parties before you. Only then is it 100, when they're 100% equal and the same, and you choose one, that's called real choice. What happens if one is different than the other? What happens if one is better or worse? You don't, that's not a choice. That's a decision. When there's absolutely no reason to take one over the other, zero reason. And you have two pieces of paper in front of you. Which one are you going to, you need a paper. Which one are you going to take? I don't, know, I don't care. There's no difference to me, right? What's the difference? We got to take one. You got to take one. So for whatever reason, your hand goes and you, you take that one. That is actually the deepest expression of your free choice. And there is nothing pretty much deeper that connected to you than that. Because the reason why you took this one over that one comes from the deepest, most essential part of who you are. You may not even have a word reason to explain it. You don't have a reason. That's precisely the point. It's not intellectual. It's not reason-based. It's my free choice. free choice. It comes from my choice. It says God, I'm choosing you. You're my chosen nation. I'm choosing your soul. The Jewish soul, the godly soul, it's not a choice. To choose a godly soul is not a choice when comparing it to non-godly soul. They're not made of the same caliber. It's a different engine. You're going to choose a, a, a V12 engine that can go, you know, uh, 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds versus a, a V4 engine and 0 to 60 in 20 minutes. That's not a choice. That's a no-brainer, as we call it in English today. The nisham is a no-brainer. When God says, I choose you, so what is he choosing? He's not referring to our soul, he's referring to our body. So why did God choose our body? We're more true to it? There's no reason. Oh, okay. There's no reason. There's no, there's no explanation for that question. If there's explanation, then it wouldn't be a choice anymore. There is only choice when there is no reason. Exactly the same. And I take you. That shows on my deepest expression of connection to you. And we see it play out in something very strange. Or as soon as say strange, but something ironic. If the body was less than the soul, if the soul was greater than the body, then who should be serving who? If you follow that logic, so you would think that the body would be serving the soul. But in reality, even the reality that we know, 
the soul comes and gives life to the body, which means it's there to service the body. We wake up and the first thing we do is thank God for restoring. We thank God for restore, restoring the soul, but the soul is there to, to service you. In other words, the body of the car, right? What's more important, the body or the engine? In the vehicle, what's more important, the body or the, or the engine? You can make a good argument for the engine. That's the argument for the soul. But at the end of the day, the engine is only pulling what? The engine is there to serve the body of the car, the interior make of the car, and how luxurious that's going to be. That's what the engine's for. It has no other purpose. Its sole purpose is to schlep along that body and whoever's sitting inside of it. So you're there to serve me. My neshama, my great and lofty, godly soul, the peace of God, comes down into this world to service my body. Hey, buddy, thank you very much. Together we make a great team. But remember, you came down here to service me. That's why you're here. And with this, we'll have a, a, final, a final idea that's going to bring it all together. When it comes to Torah, there are many different levels. How many levels are there to Torah knowledge? The greatest scholars, great scholars, teachers, regular teachers, you know, teachers in high school, teachers in college, professors. There's, there's thousands and thousands of levels. I don't know, everyone on a different level, millions of levels. When it comes to mitzvahs, on the other hand, the Talmud says, poishi, so even the greatest sinners of the Jewish people, Malay mitzvahs, kirimen, are filled with mitzvahs like a pomegranate. is filled with seeds. In other words, everybody's filled with mitzvahs. Everybody does mitzvahs. Some mitzvahs people do intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Some mitzvahs, we have so many mitzvahs between ethical mitzvahs. Just every time you say the truth, every time you smile, every time you're kind, every time you, say, every time you visit the sick, Anytime you listen to somebody who needs help, anytime you give a helping hand, everybody does these things. Even the greatest sinners of the Jewish people are filled with mitzvahs. Everybody has mitzvahs. Not everybody has Torah. Now let's bring it all together. Torah is primarily connected with which part of me? My soul. Mitzvahs are primarily connected with which part of me? My body. And with this, we can understand why in the world of the resurrection, in the future when Mashiach comes, hopefully without delay tonight, and it's going to be the rebuilding of the base of Mikdash and then gathering of the, all the Jewish people. And we'll start the services and we'll get the ball rolling. Everything is going to be good. And then it'll come a time. When it's going to be the resurrection of the dead, everyone is going to be resurrected. Why? Because that era is a reward for mitzvahs. Paradise is primarily a reward for the Torah that I study. Not everybody has Torah. And within Torah itself, there are many, many, many levels. Primarily connected with my soul. So the reward for Torah is a soul-based reward. Paradise is souls without bodies. For who? For those that exercise their soul while living on this earth. How do you exercise your soul while living on this earth? Living on this earth? Primarily through the study of Torah. The world to come, and meaning the world of the messianic age and the resurrection is going to take place, that's primarily a reward for mitzvahs. Mitzvahs are connected with my body. So I need to reward you with something that's connected with a body. That's why in that era, there's going to be specifically, it has to be, the soul has to come back into the body to get the reward. I shouldn't use the word reward. The word reward is a little bit misleading. It's a result of. 
Don't use that word. It's a result of my behavior. My mitzvahs that I do now bring me to, they're supposed to be leading me to. Every mitzvah that I do is leading me further and close, further away from where I am and closer to a divine experience. Every second I'm studying Torah is bringing me closer to a divine experience. Not only as simply a reward for what I'm doing, but it's dragging me closer. It's the result of my behavior. The result, the lane of Torah leads to a place where there are only souls. That's what the Torah is about. It's the spirit. That's, a, that's where that road takes me. The reward of my mitzvahs, that road, the result of my mitzvahs tr I, that I travel on, eventually is going to bring me to a place where I can experience as I perform a mitzvah. Body in soul. So, soul in body. That's how that experience is going to be as well. Because it's primarily a reward for my body. The body that observed all of the mitzvahs. That body belongs at, is deserving of, that type of an experience. We're not allowed to use reward? You can use reward, but there's a better word is the result. But you can result. use the word, it's not a problem. Oh, the rewards. When Mashiach's going to come, final word, when Mashiach's going to come, the Torah of Mashiach, the, the, the revelation is going to take place. The Torah that Mashiach is going to teach is going to have two, two parts to it. On the one hand, it's going to be the full experience the to of Torah, that which has never been experienced up until that point in history. Everything that we've studied, not only us, we're just midgets on the shoulders of giants who have come before us. We're the smallest people, but we're on the top of the pyramid because we have that luxury of being born now after all of the people have piled up under us. But every all that Torah is all leading us to a place, a climax. That climax is going to be this Torah, that new dimension of Torah that Mashiach is going to reveal to us. But at the same time, that the Torah experience is going to be new and a fresh experience, something that the world has never known, and it's going to come out that one would think that's going to be an advantage over mitzvahs. At the same time, it's going to be that the soul is going to get nourishment from the body. Because the body is such a lofty level, really, when Mashiach comes to be the opposite of what exists now. In order to live now, the soul has to pump life into the body. When Mashiach comes, the body is going to pump some form of energy back into the soul. Because the body's source is going to be revealed. When that's revealed, that's going to be the reality. You will see how the, the goof, the actual goof of a person, comes from God's free choice. And that level is actually what is a catalyst for and gives life to the lower level of the Nishon. And may we merit that through our work, and our behavior, and specifically through studying these ideas on what the world is going to look like in the Messianic era, and how all of us, Baruch Hashem, will all merit to have a share in the world to come, as we open with every Jew has a share in the world to come. Every Jew is called righteous. We will merit to have the revelation of the Mashiach and the new experience of Torah that he's going to teach us from his mouth without delay. Amen. Amen. Anyone Amen. have any questions on this? Uh... So just do, do they think that